Are carriers scamming us with their IMEI checks? Well, the punchline is that obviously it is a yes. Nowadays, there isn't much difference between a mobile carrier sales rep and a used car salesman. In case you don't know what an IMEI check is, it's when they tell you that your phone is incompatible with the carrier's network, even though it is. And they base this on a check of the IMEI, which is the device identifier. Oh, the tricks they do. So we need to understand their incentives and why they make it so difficult for many of us to port our phones to a new carrier. And why they make false claims about our phones being incompatible. And this will get even more extreme when eSIM becomes the norm. The new iPhone 14 is eSIM only and I can just see how much more control they get over us. If you're trying to get away from a normie phone and interested in phone solutions that remove the big tech surveillance elements on the phone, well, it is certain to be a headache and likely on purpose. Yeah, I'm ranting, but hopefully we get around some of this. Fortunately, we are able to come up with a solution that allows you to get beyond this if you're using a Brax2 phone, for example. I'll show you how I flash a new IMEI on a phone. Removing big tech eyes from our phones definitely involves work, but it is worth it. Let's understand what these carriers are up to and how we can fight back. Stay right there. First, let's understand what the IMEI is and what it actually signifies. It stands for International Mobile Equipment Identity. The IMEI is supposed to be a unique identifier of the phone, supposedly unique, that if a phone is stolen, that IMEI can be reported to some central database and then stolen phones can't be reused. And by the way, not all phones historically had IMEIs. The old CDMA phones from Sprint and Verizon instead had another identifier called MEID. But newer LTE phones that have SIM cards or eSIM capability all have an IMEI and no one uses CDMA phones anymore that I'm aware of. Old CDMA carriers like Sprint, which is now T-Mobile, and Verizon had switched to LTE and SIM cards. The IMEI is a 15-digit number and the first eight digits of this is called the TAC code or basically manufacturer and model code of the phone. And the remaining digits then are the unique numbers for each phone. The last digit is a checked digit to ensure that the IMEI is valid. So you can't just randomly add a number to the IMEI and expect it to work. Now, depending on the carrier, how the IMEI is used may vary. And also we have to define what a carrier is. In the USA, the only mobile carriers are AT&T, Mobility, Verizon Wireless, T-Mobile, and US Cellular but we have lots of companies selling us phone services and I don't call them carriers. These companies are MVNOs or mobile virtual network operators. Basically they resell the services of the main carriers, but the main service is still provided by the actual carrier. You ought to find out what the actual carrier lies behind the MVNO because it is important to understand who actually provides a service. This is important to know about compatibility and compatibility practices. So companies like Mint, Cricket, Ting, Boost, H2O, Pure Talk, Google Fi, Net10, Patreon Mobile, Red Pocket, Straight Talk, Spectrum Mobile, and so on are MVNOs. They are the resellers. Each reseller has the ability to set their own rules for what they will allow to use with their SIM card. To make it clear, anyone selling a mobile service, be it the actual mobile carrier or an MVNO, all have their own separate SIM cards. So the SIM cards are not interchangeable. Most carriers will give you a SIM for free, although some will charge some shipping. The SIM card has another identifier called IMZ, and that's what validates you on the mobile network. The validation is handled by each seller, like an MVNO or carrier itself. During the SIM validation process, the carrier can read the IMEI of the phone as well. And this does not appear to be consistent. Normally, there's no issue with the actual carriers like AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile reading the IMEI of the phone. But in testing some MVNOs, 
I'm seeing that they're recording the IMEI on activation only. They don't seem to be able to read the actual IMEI. They rely on you to put in the IMEI during activation. And that's because they're not the actual carrier. Maybe this is a capability only of the actual carrier and not an MVNO. Not sure, but just reporting from my experience, someone with inside information can fill this in. Before a phone is allowed on a phone network, the carrier will often validate the IMEI of the phone and then they will activate the SIM card. T-Mobile, for example, seems to know the actual IMEI being used currently. Ting Mobile, which uses T-Mobile as well, however, gets the IMEI during the initial activation process, but does not appear to detect the SIM card that's inserted into another phone. Make a note of this information because it will be helpful later on. Now, just a little intermission to help support this channel. My company provides services that help you maintain your privacy. We have a VPN service, Bytes VPN, which will, of course, hide your activities from the carrier. We have an email product, Braxmail, that completely eliminates the dangerous metadata in email that is seen by recipients and the internet. And our latest product is the new Brax2 privacy phone, a big tech surveillance free phone. These products are on my app, Braxme. The link is in the description. Now back to our story. The main problem with this phone IMEI checking is that all these carriers are actually looking at the TAC code portion of the IMEI, which reveals the model of the phone. And if the TAC code is not on their list of supported phones, then they kick you out and say your phone is not compatible. Now let me be clear here. There are likely tens of thousands of phone models. They make 4 billion phones a year. Yes, in the USA, the bulk of the phones are from Apple, Samsung, LG, Google, HTC. And that's not a lot of models. But if you look at the compatibility list of mobile providers like Mint and Cricket, you will see that their list of phones is tiny. Let's be more specific here. Mint is an MVNO of T-Mobile. T-Mobile has a large list of supported models. In fact, T-Mobile probably is the most flexible with phone models. Yet, Mint only allows a few models even though they're using the T-Mobile network. Now what's up with that? And Cricket, Pure Talk, and many more are doing the exact same thing, limiting the models though the actual carrier supports the phone. The original reason for checking phone models was that the carriers moved frequencies from 3G use to 5G use, so they have to free up the frequencies. The current batch of 5G phones do multi-band transmissions, meaning they communicate on many frequencies simultaneously and so they needed extra bands. Supposedly this will increase the speeds so your 5G service will be faster. So they blocked all the phone models that were 3G based or 4G phones that did not have VOLT or voice over LTE. And even this was such a bad PR move. Many, many phones blocked from the network actually had VOLT and 4G. Examples of this was the popular Motorola G7. Then even AT&T blocked the Moto G7 Plus. This is another model that has Vaulty enabled by default, and it is clearly in the settings of the phone. And in fact, in this example, T-Mobile supports the Moto G7 Plus, while AT&T does not. So these carriers are making choices to block for reasons unknown to the average consumer. Well, being a phone maker, I have some inside scoops on some of this. For example, if you want to get your phone approved by AT&T, Simple. Pay them money. Yeah, that's how you solve it. Extortion. There's a lot of payouts involved to play inside this mobile wireless circle, but that's a different topic. Now, why would an MVNO like Ting or Cricket use a smaller list than the already small list of supported phones that the main carrier has? Well, simple. They tell you your phone is incompatible and then they will sell you a brand new iPhone 14 Pro or a Google Pixel 6a. Hey, guaranteed to be compatible. Of course, they make the margin on the phones which they buy wholesale and the salesman makes a commission. They sell it to you like used car salesmen and the typical innocent consumer feels helpless and says, uh, okay. 
for many reasons, do not do this. Do not ever buy a phone from a carrier. First of all, if you buy a phone from the carrier, they will often lock the IMEI to that carrier. So you will have difficulty moving the phone to another carrier. Secondly, a carrier phone is a different model. For example, Google Pixels from carriers cannot be OEM unlocked. They cannot be de-Googled in the future and this affects their resale value. Old Google Pixels have value because they get sold as de-Googled phones later on. Thirdly, carrier sold phones often get a different OS with various apps and spyware installed by the carrier that is not included when you buy the phones directly from the manufacturer like Apple and Google. So these restrictions in place to limit the supported phone models are fake. Here's another specific example. I can be specific with Brax 2 phone since this is our phone model. The original Brax 2 phone has an unregistered IMEI. So the range of IMEIs appear to the carrier as a BlackBerry Z10. In other words, it is a BlackBerry Z10 TAC code. The Brax 2 is a 2022 phone. In fact, the motherboard is made by MediaTek and it's used in so many phone models. It is not a unique motherboard by any means. But guess what? If you take the standard Brax 2 to the MVNO like Cricket, they may activate the phone and the network will kick it out and say, a compatible HD voice device is required. HD voice, by the way, means Vault T. Now we have a capability with Brax 2 that can't be done easily on most phones. We can change the IMEI of the phone. So if I take a Brax 2 phone and change the IMEI to appear as a Google Pixel 4, for example, Cricket works, Mint works, Pure Talk works, AT&T works, everything works. In other words, it's a lie. The phone obviously has the correct equipment without being a new model motherboard. But the USA carriers play this little game and say it won't work, thus bringing FUD to the consumer. The consumer then thinks it's better to be safe. Let's stay away from these privacy phones because they're not guaranteed to work. Well, I just proved it's a lie. Carrier after carrier. I have a stack of SIM cards from various carriers. All that were rejecting the phone before will not reject it if the TAC code is from some famous phone model. Now I'll let you try a few experiments yourself. I've done this, so nothing to fear. Let's say you have five phones and all of them are supported models by a particular carrier. Let's say they are late model Samsungs, iPhones, and Google Pixels. Try this, move the SIM card to any of the supported models and it will work immediately. If it's an actual carrier like T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T, they will also likely update the access point name or APN settings on the phone that directs traffic to the correct point in the carrier network. Now, MVNOs often are not updating the APN correctly and the phone fails initially, so just be aware of that. Now, let me vary this experiment so you understand it. Let's say you have five different phones and all have the same IMEI. Plug in the SIM card to any of those phones and the carrier will think it's the same phone. They really just care about the SIM card. Now, of course, the phone itself needs to have the features required by the carrier. So obviously using a 3G phone where there is no longer 3G frequencies will not be useful. But the scam is that banning phone models is not based on the actual capability of the phone, but a deliberate attempt to limit phone models. Using the TAC code of the IMEI is an abuse of the consumer and they're using it as a ploy to sell more phones. I hope it causes them to lose business. The worst offenders in the IMEI locking are Mint and Cricket. And if I have more offenders to mention, I will broadcast that over and over in the future. These two companies have the smallest list of supported models. So Ryan Reynolds is the owner of one of these scam companies. Now something I mentioned earlier is that if you go to a mobile provider like Ting Mobile, they activate you first by asking for the IMEI of the phone you're activating. This is stored in their database. But as I told you, they don't actually check the IMEI while it is being used. They only check the TAC code if it's an unsupported device. Here's what's interesting. You can activate any phone 
on a Ting Mobile, for example, and then move the SIM card to another phone. So their stupid check on the IMEI is meaningless anyway. Let me explain a few more details about the IMEI that probably most people don't know. There's actually no official enforcement of the IMEI. Many phone manufacturers, mostly in China, will just put in any IMEI on the phone. And the reason is that if you're creating a new phone model with a small run, to get an official TAC code, you have to register the phone with GSMA. And this means that you have to pay a lot of money to get this TAC code. A lot of money. So why bother if you're making a small run? For most of the world, it didn't matter. Mostly, the IMEI was used to lock phones to carriers and to prevent stolen phones from being used. But this procedure is meaningless nowadays because IMEI locking is by country only. Each country uses a different IMEI block list database. So phones that are locked in one country can be shipped to another country and they work fine. In other words, IMEIs pretty much didn't solve any theft issue. And since there is no official registry of IMEIs, the only detail became those that had registered IMEIs with GSMA versus those that didn't. So IMEIs are not important anymore from a law enforcement point of view, except as a means to identify a unique phone for surveillance reasons. Only the UK appears to have some law relating to limits on changing IMEIs on existing phones. Senator Chuck Schumer in the U.S. introduced a bill to ban the changing of IMEIs, but that did not go forward. Thus, IMEIs are fair game. And just to be clear, the SIM card has the IMSI identifier, and that is a different matter. Playing around and hacking the IMSI, if you could do that, will definitely be criminal. IMEI is not a service contract, it is just a phone identifier that's not even official. It's not even guaranteed to be unique. So if you want a phone that you can flash IMEIs to all day, you can do that to a Brax2 phone. I'll give you a short tutorial on how to flash an IMEI to a Brax2 phone in a moment. Please follow the laws in your country. If your country has a law that bans the flashing of IMEI, other than by the manufacturer, then don't do this. And by the way, I am the manufacturer of the Brax2 phone, so I can flash IMEIs all day in any case. All my instructions for flashing an IMEI is on Brax2Me in the FAQ section on Brax2 phones. So go to Brax2Me and you'll find it. Pretty much all you need is one zip file, which is snwritertool.zip. This instruction only works on Brax2 phones and many other models that use MediaTek motherboards. For example, the Brax2 phones uses the MT6771 motherboard. In order to flash the IMEI of a phone, you need a database from the manufacturer of the motherboard. So most other phones in the USA have a Qualcomm motherboard or a Samsung motherboard. So they would have their own unique instructions for IMEI flashing. This is a custom app made for MediaTek. The first thing you need to get is the correct USB cable to connect the phone to your Windows computer. Yes, this only works in Windows. I've tested only on Windows 10 and Windows 11. The cable itself needs to be made for USB 2.0 or USB 3.0. And you can tell because the tip on the USB-A side is black or blue. If it is white, you cannot use this cable. Find a correct one. Next, unzip the snwritertool.zip to your preferred location on your computer. In my case, I put it here in an snwritertool folder. From here, it is massively simple because I've already prepped everything in the zip file. Just run SNWriter EXE. This will launch the SNWriter app. On the port, select COM port USB VCOM. Target type, smartphone. And then open system config. Look at the items checked here. IMEI, IMEI checksum dual IMEI. In my case, dual IMEI is checked, so I don't need two different IMEIs. 
In the database file section, I checked both the load APDB from DUT and load modem DB from DUT. I click on MD1DB and select the file I want. I need to find my particular MediaTek motherboard, which is MT6771. Then I'm looking for this file that says custom. I repeat the process for APDB and this time I pick the file that does not have enum on it. Next, I specify where I want the log to be in. Usually, I point this to the same SN Writer Tool folder. Save, and now you're ready to do a flash. Get your phone and cable ready. Phone has to be off and do not plug in the cable yet. Now hit start. Put in your desired IMEI and hit OK. While it is searching, now is the moment to plug in the phone and the cables. It will then show the status here. The first part may have a long wait if it has to install drivers. So let it do that and you may have to repeat it until the USB drivers are installed. They install automatically. When it is complete, it will say pass and you can unplug the phone and you're done. Now, as far as selecting which IMEI to use, personally, I'd like to choose an IMEI from another phone I own or the IMEI of the phone of someone you know. This way, it is not likely to be reported as stolen or locked by the carrier. As far as what kind of phone to take the IMEI from, frankly, as long as the original phone works on the carrier you're going to be using, I wouldn't care. And so far, it doesn't seem to matter if you use the same IMEI on several phones. They're only looking at the TAC portion of the IMEI for validating network compatibility. Now, just understand that some mobile providers ask for an IMEI for activation purposes. This can be any IMEI that works on their network and doesn't even have to be flashed to the phone. They're just recording your model for posterity. Uh, maybe to sell you another phone? Being able to change the IMEI of a phone is a huge privacy factor. But the big plus is we get to fight back the scam that these mobile providers are pushing, telling us that certain models are incompatible when they are obviously compatible. The only 4G compatibility issue really aside from the IMEI check, is if the phone has all the necessary bands in your area. In general, international phones do not have band 4, and they have band 3 instead. In the USA, band 4 is more used, so many areas may depend on band 4. We will be making available a Brax2 phone model with a band 4 or 66 in early October, though in our experience, this is not an issue for the majority of people. Mostly, it's an issue for Verizon and some areas using T-Mobile. In any case, we will have a handle on Band 4 66 shortly after this video is released. I'm on other platforms. I'm on Rumble.com and Odyssey.com. I also have my own platform, Braxme, where my store is. In case I get the platform, please follow me on these other platforms. The links are in the description. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.